you have hopes, then you have high hopes, and then you have these ridiculously high hopes. And we got rewarded time and time again. The Last of Us has been propped up as the savior of video game adaptations. Ironic, since many refer to the original as already being a movie disguised as a video game. And with a premiere viewership of 4.7 million, The Last of Us beat every other HBO program except for, of course, our beloved House of the Dragon. It has Pedro Pascal, it has the writer of the original game, it even has Pedro Pascal. So, can we finally say that video games can make good TV? Has HBO rediscovered the key to quality adaptations? I say yes, they have. But also no. No, they have not. Just let me explain, alright? But, before we get into it, I want to encourage you all to join me in the Last of Us Glimpse of Hope challenge over at Wirestock.io, where you can use their AI image generator to create all kinds of cool AI generated art. The challenge is to depict iconic Last of Us moments that radiate hope and happiness. It's free to enter, and apart from the street cred, you can win cash prizes too. I had a lot of fun messing around with it, and here are some of my creations. It's free to try out, so let me know what you think if you give it a go. And if you can't take your hands off of it, use the code CULTURE20 to get a discount of 20% and access to a thousand generated images per month, as well as the reimagine and image mixer features. Have fun and good luck! First and foremost, I'm reviewing the TV show, and like any good story, it should stand on its own. Viewers should be able to enjoy it without having to spend hours moving furniture and mashing the X button. Because at the end of the day, you couldn't have the game without the story, and so the question becomes, can we have the story without the game? Regardless, it's still a wonder that HBO went out of their way to make a great adaptation of a video game, considering how the bar is pretty low. However, a great adaptation doesn't necessarily make a great show. And with the varying amount of content to use from the game, what you keep and what you change makes all the difference. And if you want to make a difference, then make sure to subscribe, it helps the channel grow. Wow, that was really bad. I need to work on my segue. Ask yourself this. Why don't most games work as movies or TV series? Well, it's because the number one thing that games convey to the player is not the story, but gameplay. When you're adapting something like a video game into a passive participation form of art, like watching television, you have to make quite a few changes. Adapting The Last of Us to TV was a good idea because unlike most AAA games, the story was always the primary focus. The story is far more nuanced and delves deeper into its themes than most games do. And even though the trope of an older man stuck with a spirited youth has been done many, many times before, The Last of Us puts enough of a spin on it to make it unique. Nonetheless, a big differentiator between the show and the game is how they treat its side stories. For instance, where the original brushes past Bill and Frank as a minor tragedy, the show actually builds them up and gives us characters to care about. Nick Offerman doesn't just play a grittier Ron Swanson, but really gets to show his range as an actor. I also love the story of Nick reading an older version of the script on set and fighting to put this line back in. Not today, you new world order jackboot f And while Henry is portrayed very similar to the game, the addition of Sam being mute creates a layer of dependency that makes the heartbreak of their story much stronger and a welcome change at that. Well, not welcome as in I wish more kids were mute, but like, you know what I mean. The characters from the game also make a perfect fit for TV. The cast is phenomenal at best and fits the bill at worst. It's also worth mentioning how several of the original voice actors came to feature in the show. Hell, Marlene is played by the same actress in both the game and the show. Troy Baker, who voices Game Joel, kinda got the short end of the stick, whereas the voice of Ellie, Ashley Johnson, got to take it home with a killer performance. And by that, I mean she died. The pinnacle selections, though, are, of course, Bella Ramsey and Pedro Pascal. God, I love Pedro Pascal. In many cases, live-action adaptations just throw a random famous guy into the protagonist roles without caring too much if the role fits at all. Here, though, I don't think they could have found anyone better. And I'll be honest, I only started watching the show because Pedro was in it. But, like, who didn't? It's not just the characters, though. Visually, this show just looks good. The coloring is surprisingly vibrant, like the game, without being too much. The practical effects and cinematography are entirely focused on world building and character building as they should. The cosmetics of the show, like the zombies, the CGI, and makeup artists, all go out of their way to make them terrifying. 
I mean, you wouldn't really expect anything less from a blockbuster, but I've been proven wrong before. Most impressively, however, the game and the show share the same atmosphere. Although I wish they explored this more, this subtle suspenseful vibe can be found in some of the action scenes. Like the game, the action steals the jagged momentum of a horror movie. However, unlike the game, since they need to translate the hands-on experience of gameplay, they use clever cinematography to pull us in. On a strictly production standpoint, no other video game adaptation stands up to this one. Dare I say some book adaptations could learn a thing or two here. And since all of this was done so well, then that means the show was perfect and made everyone happy, right? Right? Look, despite all the great things this show has going for it, the actors, the narrative, the atmosphere, I just can't like the show. Why? Because it's a mess. By far the biggest problem with the show, like so many these days, is the pacing. The show covers an absurd amount of ground in barely half the game's runtime. Trust me, I did the math. If you stick to the bare minimum, the game takes roughly 17 hours to complete, including optional content. The show is not even 9 hours long, also including optional content. If they cut back on scenes and characters that didn't directly affect Joel and Ellie, maybe the show could have fit in 9 episodes. Or, here's a crazy idea, make more episodes. Or even split the narrative up in two full seasons that delve all the way into the themes and side characters that they obviously wanted to explore. I mean, come on. And yet, when asked why the show was oddly short, Mason commented that going beyond 9 episodes would demand too much of the audience. What, just, what, what does that even mean? Yes, they needed to cut a lot of the game's downtime, but not all of it. The hundreds of small moments scattered throughout the game weren't exactly redundant. These moments are where the slowly knit connection between Joel and Ellie happens. There's value in seeing Ellie laughing at a garden gnome. There's value in hearing Joel try and convince kids that ice cream trucks existed. Ice cream truck? And there's value in Joel protecting Ellie over and over again. <laughs> But instead of replacing these connections, the show strips all this bonding, leaving only cliches like the joke book and symbolic knives and end up skipping right to the part where they would die for each other. Or kill for each other, I guess. Well, the show does try to make up for this by expanding on the side characters, but they make a critical error in doing so. In the game, the side characters directly affect or develop Joel and Ellie's relationship. The show, on the other hand, has these characters function more indirectly. For example, in the game, Bill works with Joel and Ellie to find and fix a car to escape, whereas the show has them coincidentally inherit the car after Bill lives and dies independently from the main narrative. Sure, I get that a lot of these separated arcs are meant to reflect Joel and Ellie's relationship. That much was made abundantly clear. You think the whole world revolves around him? That he's worth everything? But I'd rather have Joel and Ellie explore these developments themselves instead of having someone experience it for them. They simply don't get enough time to build a steady connection, so shortcuts and shallow dialogue start creeping in to tell us how to feel about them. I'm not family. No, you're cargo. Ironically, because of this lack of depth, Bill and Frank end up having more emotional impact in one episode than Joel and Ellie do over the entire season. Like, let's be honest, in 10 years you'll remember how you cried when those two guys died together. You might not remember the show it was from, but you will remember them. And this isn't just a pacing issue. While Bill and Frank at least benefited from the changes, other characters didn't get off so lucky. For instance, Ellie being more crude and tomboyish than in the game feels like another shortcut for her and Joel to connect faster. Having her start at this extreme undermines the shift from gentle to violent that we see in the game. David being turned into a religious leader does have potential, but his preaching doesn't change or amplify the story whatsoever. Especially since his very important commune is introduced and forgotten in the very same episode. Sam and Henry, despite having one of my favorite changes, also add my least favorite change. Henry being a collaborator. I don't work with rats. It's tacked on and doesn't add any depth. If anything, it loses depth. In the game, Henry leaves Joel behind to die, We're leaving. What? but then comes back to save him. Henry! He's awake! There's no sloppy backstory about some Jesus dude who died off-screen required to make their characters connect. He was so beautiful. 
If only there was a concept they taught you in every writing course ever about showing things happening instead of just talking about it. Hmm. But anyways, at least Henry and Sam have a proper resolution. Most of the other plot lines and character arcs are set up and paid off so quickly they don't accomplish what they're supposed to. Like finding and crashing Bill's car. Or Ellie harboring a gun. And honestly everything about Kansas. Or the preacher, him too. Oh, and how they rushed the ending. It's okay, baby girl. They've actually... You may notice that all these setups are paid off at the latest in the following episode. The show desperately wants to be episodic and overarching at the same time. Episodic in how issues are introduced and resolved as quickly as possible, and overarching in how the story wants to slowly build up Joel and Ellie's relationship. Yes, it is possible to have the show be both episodic and overarching, but not at the same time. Shows like CSI and House focus on the episodic drama and quick-paced conundrums. Despite having overarching storylines, they don't replace the main plot since they know their priorities are episodic. Meanwhile, shows like Westworld and Game of Thrones focus on the overarching buildup from episode to episode. And although they do have episodic elements, they don't rush through them since they know their priorities are overarching. The problem here is that The Last of Us prioritizes both equally throwing around emotionally charged scenes but without enough time to enjoy the episodic drama, nor its overarching impact. The scene where Ellie fires the gun and later when Joel teaches her how to use it are legitimately great scenes in and of themselves. However, they are held back by the fact that this was just set up 20 minutes earlier. And that's one of the better examples. Other events don't hit nearly as hard, like everyone trying to find a way out of Kansas and then easily finding a way out of Kansas. Or Joel finding his long lost brother, arguing with him, arguing with Ellie, making up with both, leaving his long lost brother and getting stabbed, all in the same episode. This show is packed with good scenes, but none of them are ever fully earned. And look, this isn't rocket science, it's just strange because the beginning of the show is paced fairly well. The pilot is neither too long nor too short, Tess goes out with a bang, pun intended, and Bill and Frank's story is capped off with a stroke of cinematic genius. Full circle, very sad, job done. But then you have whole arcs like episode 7 where build up is attempted yet ends without a proper conclusion. In the game, this chapter isn't part of the base game. It's optional DLC made for those who want that extra bit of backstory. However, the show decided to make it quintessential. The chapter ends right before Ellie traumatically discovers her immunity, and all we get for watching them play on merry-go-rounds and arcade machines is... a cutaway. Question. If you're not gonna show this pivotal moment, then what the f*** was all this long-winded build-up for? Sure, the scenes showing Ellie falling out with her peers and getting sent to the headmaster's office gives us insights we didn't already have. But what we see from Ellie in the mall are either things we already know, or things that never get to be relevant. Fans of this episode might say that it's faithful to the source, that it's emphasizing Ellie's determination to save Joel in the current timeline, or that Storm Reed can do no wrong, but not even a perfect storm can carry a script missing its final pages. Adding the experience of Riley turning and Ellie realizing that she won't be turning herself would have done the trick. Also, who wouldn't want to see that? Imagine, just for a moment, how legendary this would be. They could have even played it out with Ellie trying everything possible not to kill Riley only to be left with no other choice. The fanboys and girls would have talked about it for years to come. God damn it. It's mistakes like this that reveal how the show didn't delve into its themes enough. It wants to touch on so many topics and stories, but ends up stretching itself far too thin to be thoroughly enjoyed. You'd think that HBO would have learned that people want more content at this point, but for whatever reason they seem to only want to do the bare minimum. It's too much of not enough. Yeah. The ironic truth is, The Last of Us succeeded in being a loyal adaptation. And it's not just the fact that several themes are frame-for-frame -frame remakes of the game, it's how where the game stands out, the show does as well. However, where the game struggles or fails, the show fails even harder. That's the ever-present struggle with adaptations, trying to replicate what made something special while improving on it. Sometimes an impossible feat. Here, though, I don't think it was. 
I genuinely believe that this was an open goal and with a few better decisions, this would have done amazingly well. Or, I guess, amazingly well-er. Look, guys, I'm trying, alright? But hey, all things considered, I still think this is a net win, despite how disappointed I was. It's a step in the right direction for video game adaptations. Over the years, they have evolved from being obscure pieces of shit to mainstream pieces of shit. And if future adaptations receive the same respect and care that this show got, I have a feeling we're in for a treat. Let me show you how it's done. Eventually. Thanks for watching.